so this is my last entry for the day, is a composition entry. And I want to start with that because it's a very important point. This is not, after performing twice already today, this is not actually about my performance. I will give you a little reading sample so that, to prove that my composition can be performed, that it works as lines of dialogue. But the point for this exercise is I want to be judged on the work itself. This is a piece of writing that should be able to be given to any actors, not just the person who wrote it, and it should stand. Very much the same way um, a composition in sheet music should be given to any musician. Um, my goal was simply to write a scene and then prove that I had written it in a form that could have appeared on the Elizabethan stage. Uh, so let me start with a very basic, this is a scene of dialogue in which two actors converse with each other interactively. This was done on the Elizabethan stage. You hardly need to prove this. You can walk into any bookstore in any English-speaking country in the world and walk out with something written by William Shakespeare. Um, so the very, at the very basic level, it works as a bit of dialogue. Now, I, after we perform the dialogue, I'm going to talk about the other specific things that I did to ensure that this was in a period style. Um, but first, just to show that this actually works as dialogue, I've invited the talented Lizette to, to join me, and we will read to you the script. Actually, let me set this up briefly. The play that this comes from has never been written. But the conceit of the play is that a man who has a fever and is convalescing meets a fair lady, and they converse. And then for the rest of the play, he doesn't manage to catch her again to the point where he begins to wonder if she was real or a dream because he had a fever. And that is the central line conceived. And of course, at the end of the play, they meet again and are married and everyone's happy. Um, because at least the comedy ends in marriages. This is the tragedy ends in body count. Um, so the theme of um, dreaming runs through their conversation. And after we read the scene, I will also talk a little bit about whether that would be an appropriate theme for most of audience. So, are you ready? Yes. What man, while waking, sees a sight so rare? Am I dreaming still? Dream you now, my lord. I must, for daylight hours hold no compare, and night alone such visions does afford. I wish you dreams, but not alone for dear sleep's restful sake, though rest you may require. Beyond sleep's silent shore draw fancies near our hearts repose. And waking, we desire nothing but the relief of pleasant dreams. And to our pillows thus in vain return. Here I with waking ears, and yet it seems, my eyes asleep for all I can discern. Oh, would that I could never more to wake. That wish be denied for the wisher's sake. The sleep that does not end comes soon enough, and leaves the living with the loss. Peace, friend. The hand of death is cold and rough. To hold this dream is all I do intend. May all your dreams be long and gentle. Then to restful repose may you now return, and let sweet Morpheus' kind fancies send to bathe you in clouds and cease all concern. Awake or sleep, let me now abide, and never from this moment change my state. Now care I not if mares of night I ride, or awake my returning strength await. For beauty from my dream stands me before, and I can not but cherish the door. It's very short. It's 28 lines. Why 28 is a point we'll be getting to. Um, let me start by, by discussing the theme a little bit. I am not aware of the actual conceit of is this person real or a dream being used in the Elizabethan play. Now, mind you, I haven't read every Elizabethan play in existence, but I've never encountered that conceit. However, the idea of sleep and dreams and their resemblance to reality, and they're also as a metaphor for impermanence, runs through a lot of work in the period. Uh, it's in The Tempest, it's in Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, there are sonnets by Samuel Daniel and Edmund Spencer that all deal with you know, sleep, controlling sleep, sleep versus dream versus reality. So these would not have been unfamiliar conceptually they would definitely have been accessible to a Elizabethan audience. Uh, as for the structure, one of the most common meters for Elizabethan theater is iambic pentameter. 
So I'm going to start with what is ionic pentameter. It's, well, it's a meter of five ions. Is that clear enough for everybody? Yes. Um, and I am, poetry, metered poetry is, is broken down into units called feet. One type of foot is an ion. An ion is a combination of two syllables. The first is unstressed, the second is stressed. Ta-da! Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. That's, that's iambic. Uh, so a meter of five ions mean every line has 10 syllables, and every second syllable is stressed which sounds, when you talk about it, like it should be really awful. But it's actually a very natural rhythm for the English language. Uh, so, you know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. It just falls very naturally. I wonder if it's going to rain. I wonder if it's going to rain. Four score, it's seven years ago. So, it's not just for Elizabethans. It's, um, so that is the, uh, rhythm that my piece should be written in. So, what man will greet me? Ah, sorry. What man will waking sees a sight so rare? I wish you dreams, but not alone for dear. Sleep's restful sake, though rest you may require. So the piece should, if I have done it correctly, be written in this very specific rhythm. Now, there's another trick, though, because that's fairly basic, and also it is not universal to the speaking uh, meter. It was one of the most common, but for example, Macbeth's witches do not speak in pentameter. Uh, there are other examples. Um, earlier this morning, I did a play, uh, The Night of the Burning Pestle, which starts in iambic pentameter and gets interrupted, and the interruption was very carefully not written in iambic pentameter, because it's supposedly not an act of being interrupted, even though it really is. So these things were played with. Um, one of the things that I found when preparing this was a scholar, Ben Crystal, who was talking about various things in the language of Shakespeare. And he noted that in Romeo and Juliet, there are sonnets. There are actually sonnets in the play. The play, in fact, opens with one, um, although I should be careful saying that, because I cited Romeo and Juliet in this from the first folio. And the opening monologue that we're all familiar with, two houses both alike in dignity from fair Verona where we lay our scene, is not in the first folio. But that is a sonnet um, in its structure. Now a scene that is in the first folio is when Romeo and Juliet first encounter one another. And what's really interesting is that scene is also a sonnet. But unlike the prologue, it's not a monologue, it's dialogue between two people. Hmm. And it still forms a sonnet. So this is also written in two sonnets. Sonnets are 14 lines long, which is why my piece is precisely 28 lines <laughs> long. Um, so having this plain dynamic pentameter, I now have to prove that I know what a sonnet is. <laughs> okay, a sonnet is a 14-line poem in iambic pentameter. Now, there are different types of sonnets, Elizabethan, Petrarchan, and Italian. Um, the Elizabethan sonnet the structure is three quatrains, which are line, basically four-line blocks stanzas, followed by two lines, a couple at the end. And it has a very specific rhyme pattern. First line and third line rhyme, second line and fourth line rhyme. And that's repeated to the quatrains, and then the couple at the end rhymes with itself. So this piece is actually written in two sonnets. Uh, the first sonnet ends with the couplet, Oh, would that I could never more to wake, that wish be denied for the wisher's sake. And the final uh, couple, of course, for beauty for my dream stands me before, and I cannot but worship and adore. So in the documentation, um, also just for the record, does anyone in the audience like to see a copy? Okay, in the documentation, I have taken the meeting from Romeo and Juliet and broken it down um, in both theatrical dialogue form and in sonnet form. And it lays out perfectly. And then I did the same thing with my entry. Now, here comes the fun part. I made a big mistake. <laughs> um, my first sonnet, I read you the last two quatrain. Um, one person says, oh, would that I could never more to wake. And the other one says, that wish be denied for the wisher's sake. That's a lousy way to end a sonnet. Because those the couplets, the lines of the couplet are directly contradicting each other. It's thematically incorrect because there's a thematic structure to a sonnet. Not only does it have to fit a certain 
physical constraint, you know, four lines here, four lines here, 14 lines total, 10 syllables per line, there is also a thematic pattern. Each stanza is a concept. The concepts build, the couplet resolves or is kind of almost a punchline to them. My first sonnet fails this test. So I am at work, so rather than scrapping and starting over, I extended the scene to a, through a, the entire length of the second sonnet. The second sonnet has a thematic structure that the first one is lacking and actually ends harmoniously with a closing concept. This was actually very interesting. This is because this was something that, I mean, I knew I've written sonnets before. I knew the thematic structure was there, but I did not think it would be so disharmonious in broken into theatrical dialogue. And yet the theatrical dialogue is much stronger in the second half where the sonnet is properly constructed. And if you go back and look at the dialogue from Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare got it right, of course. Now, mind you, Shakespeare wrote hundreds of sonnets in addition to writing plays, so he knew what he was doing. But what I learned from the exercise, essentially, is if the play is going to be written in poetry, it can't just follow the technical structure of poetry. It also has to acknowledge the thematic content of poetry. And so basically, my argument is that this piece meets the metrical requirement. It is written in a style that was actually used in Romeo and Juliet, therefore we know it was used in period, and that at least the second half of it is constructed correctly. <laughs> and so that is my presentation. Do we have any questions? Because <laughs> this is your thing. I'm kind of awestruck, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is very well done. Thank Thank you. You. I have a couple of questions. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Hello, you're welcome. Wow. Unfortunately, I have to judge you based on how you provide it in, in the sense of a persona. Okay. Um, can you give, give us some idea as to how someone in the 16th century, century or 17th century would have brought this forward, understanding that you're, you're providing a piece of a play? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, this is also very interesting to me because normally, you know, I get up out here and I'm like, hey, I'm in my happy own persona as the performer. Today I'm a playwright. Right. Um, so first of all, the reason this is actually Act One, Scene Five, is because that's when Romeo and Juliet meet. So I figured that was a pretty good indication about what point in your plot structure you know, these characters would come together for the first time. It is clearly intended to be part of a full play. Now it would be very hard to just write a play and say, "Hey, someone want to perform this?" I mean, we do that all the time today. In Elizabethan theater, there were companies. Shakespeare wrote for the King's Men. He knew who was going to be performing. You know, he knew who his actors were. The parts were often written for specific actors. And they had a whole industry going. They were a repertory theater. I'm going to produce plays. They're going to keep producing plays over and over again. And then new ones will be added in cycle. And you know, of course, they had an advantage. They were the entertainment industry. I mean, you know, they weren't competing with video games. <laughs> um, but basically, to present, if, if I understand your question, how would I present this as a play to somebody? I would have to be in the employ of somebody who hired playwrights, and I would probably have a company for which I was writing. And to get into that position, I would probably have to be trained with somebody who wrote plays. Um, how long is this It's odd. I have written whole plays in less time than it took to write those 28 lines. <laughs> um, well, one of the things is, I have an okay year for pentameter. I, you know, I, there are people I know who just you know, boom, 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 just just whip it out. And uh, you know, I would write a line and it would be a good line. I'd be solid. Three lines later, I'd look back at that first line and go, stressed, stressed, damn. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there was a lot, um, which is why I say hopefully this is all in pentameter. You have copies in the documentation. You can you know, <laughs> count the syllables if you wish. Um, but and there's actually it's a very amusing. Um, normally, one of the things they do in, in they like to do in the other half of this competition, the arts and sciences half, is show the work in progress. You know, this is my first carbon. This is the cast in bronze version. If you turn to the very back, this is what it looked like in its final form before I did the last cleanup. The characters' names are he and she <laughs> instead of Orlando and Constanza. And over here we have the last word of each rhyme, 
um, even if it doesn't fall at the end of the, the line, it falls where it's supposed to, so I can track where the sonnet is. Um, I should probably explain that. In the Romeo and Juliet piece, there are a couple places where they finish each other's lines. He will say five syllables, and then she will say five syllables. Mm. And the ten-syllable line that makes up the poem is actually divided between them. Wow. Which I did at the beginning. Of, which I did at the beginning of this one, when I say, "Am I dreaming still?" and she says, "Can you still, my lord?" That's a ten-syllable line between, split between the two of us. Woo. So I had to track. Okay, I'm supposed to be rhyming with what word? <laughs> and so you can actually see. And I also have these A B A B C D C D at the end. Or am I tracking the rhyme scheme? Question for that. Well, well yeah, I, uh, when you're talking about Romeo and Juliet, is it the Holy Palmer's yes. speech? Yes, Palm the Palm the Holy Palmer's kiss. Oh, okay. I, I just wasn't sure. That is, in fact, the scene I'm talking about. So would you carry this further? further? Would you write? Would you be willing to go through that? Or is this just <laughs> or was this an exercise from your brain? Yeah. Right? I, I might after sufficient rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I have actually written a full-length Elizabethan-style play. I wrote it, actually, this predates the Kingdom Bardic Championship competition. I wrote it for Kingdom A&S. It was actually very funny, because the other competitor that year was Giuseppe. <laughs> and it was like, after years of people turning in calligraphy and null binding and funny hats, they got two bards. They didn't know what to do with us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Giuseppe won, which, of course, is no surprise for being you know, against Giuseppe. But I had a great time. And, but that time, I focused a lot more on the overall big picture of the lead, this Elizabethan play. I documented the five-act structure. I broke down the five acts of a comedy. I didn't use Much Ado About Nothing. And a tragedy, I used Marlowe's Faustus. Here's the rising action in each act. And then my play had to fit the same pattern. Um, I did you know, all the, I said, OK, what are conceits I'm going to use that were common? I used People in Disguise and lovers who don't recognize that they're perfect for each other at first. And so that was the big picture. Unfortunately, the language and the poetry were not as good, because I was focused on the big picture. This is the little picture, very tightly focused, but it's only 28 lines. So theoretically, with what I learned doing this, and what I learned doing that, yeah, this masterwork could be possible. But I am also one of the things I learned is just how much work it would be. How many plays a year did you guys? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. um, you know, the Elizabethan playwrights were, were admirable. Um, now, mind you, as I said, he also wrote 100 songs. He knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. the, the language of Amic the Pameter was in most of the theater at the time. They knew what it sounded like. But of course, the biggest advantage that Shakespeare had is. I have to work 40 hours a week putting <laughs> stuff on a website. <laughs> you know, he had a patron and he had a theater company, and it was like, here's your living. Write us another play. <laughs> Romeo and Ethel is overdue. Come on. <laughs> um, you know, if, if I were employed as a playwright meaningfully for several years, I probably could do some of this. You know. So, did you have the vision first, or did you start writing and then fit the vision to the writing? I had the initial conceit. Um, this conversation was, you know, are you a figure out of my dreams? To which she replies, are you awake or not? You know? <laughs> and that byplay, um, I had that concept. But it really, the scene, when you're working this closely in poetry, the scenes really have to shape themselves as you work. Because half of it's like, I have to get this mention of impermanence and death in there, because that's one of the metaphors for sleep and dream they use. At the same time, I have to have a word that rhymes with wake. <laughs> so the rhymes can be quite a burden. Then. Yes. Um, well, actually, um, there's an interesting question that I've seen twice, once in a series of novels by Madeleine Engel and once in a class taught by Sir Brand, which is, why would anyone write a sonnet? I mean, if I can write free verse and say what's in my heart, why would I write a sonnet? Which is like working in a cage. And the answer is the structure actually brings out stuff that you would not have thought of if you were not using the structure. It brings out different parts of your vocabulary. It engages different parts of your brain. Another example I learned from storytelling is if you tell someone, OK, you're now going to do an improvisational storytelling entry. Tell a story. They're like, huh, what? But you notice what most of them do? All right, I need three words from the audience. <laughs> because, OK, I have a castle and a fish. OK, I have to make a connection between a castle and a fish. And the brain starts working. 
and making these connections. So I'm looking for, you know, a rhyme for would I could never more awake. Oh, would that were not true for the wishers' sake? Those lines would never have been in there. They were, they're good lines, they just sadly they don't belong at the end of a sonnet. But they would not have been in there if I were not trying to use that structure. Um, so yes, if I had <coughs> said, sufficient rest, sufficient motivation, and enough time, it would be interesting to write the whole play. But the goal would have to be to achieve both things, the full structure and correct style and the language. And not lose your sanity in the process. Yes. Yeah. Question from back. I am um, curious, you talked a little about sort of, you know, the, the overall structure of the piece and the, the sort of general conceit about dreaming and sleep. And I'm wondering how much attention you put into your specific word choices or any, you know, figures of speech in terms of making sure these are things that would be familiar to the, the 16th century person or not. Um, and that's a, I'm asking a question that well, implies a lot of work, I realize. Yes. I'm curious. <laughs> there is. Let's say about 60%. Because a lot of times, I mean, okay, mares of night. Okay, the word nightmare, do, you know, is that old? So that's a conceit they would have gotten. Um, you know, um, Silent Shore draws fancies near. Fancies as a noun was used. So I am trying. But on the other hand, you know, I did not like sit down and meticulously word check each individual word to make sure it existed in Elizabethan England. I obviously didn't, you know, use modern. I mean, here's one that drove me crazy. I saw a movie recently that was set in the early '60s, and they were talking about thinking outside the box, and it dropped me right out of the movie because that's a modern phrase. So I was trying very hard not to have anything that would drop the reader violently <coughs> out of the piece. You, a Me playwright, <laughs> have crafted a pretty good pair of sonnets as part of a play. Why did you bring an art sciences entry to a bardic competition? Um, okay, the bardic competition, historically, the Kingdom Bardic Competition, has allowed competition entry or composition entries. Uh, for the first year, Master Leith won the competition with basically a multi choral composition. He did not perform it, he wrote it. He made a listening sample of it and had it judged as a composition, and that is legal for King of Arctic. Okay. <laughs> Troublemaker. Well, no, the legal <laughs> here's the other thing is, it, you, you, want a, you want a really honest answer also? This year, okay, last time I gave you the King of Arctic, I had very little time to prepare because I was at the last minute entry to make sure that someone entered the competition. And I was not really entirely happy with my work. So this year, one of my goals was to hit my strong points. My strong points are theater, storytelling, and original composition. So those are my three entries today. This is the original composition. I have a question. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that the Elizabethan playwright usually worked for a company and had specific actors that they wrote for. Modern playwrights are usually writing actor neutral and hope to cast somebody that fits their, their brain image. Which style do you use as a playwright, or if you use both, how does that influence? Most of the stuff that I have written has, in fact, been actor neutral. It's, I have a modern brain. Um, okay. The I usually I have enough friends, especially when I'm running for the SCA, that I try and think that this is a part that is doable by people I know. But usually, it's not. It must be this person in this part. Um, actually, one of the things that's really fun as a playwright, it's scary as hell, but it's great when it works. Take your play, hand it to somebody else, let them cast and direct it. <laughs> no, but that's the proof of the pudding. That's how you know it works. Because if this only works, if I get Farron in this part, then it doesn't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, doesn't, it will not stand the test of time. So, so yeah, I'm more modern, I am more actor neutral. But we do know, um, in fact, I've seen entries by this um, from other people, for example, that um, when Shakespeare's main clown actor changed, uh, I'm trying to remember, it went from Burbage to Ken. Ken. Um, he went from being this, you know, big Falstaff rowdy drug clown to the clever word manipulations of the nearest fool, and that changed because the actor doing most of the clown scenes actually changed. So we do know that that kind of writing was done for the original actor in Elizabethan England. I'm more of a modern writer, sorry. <laughs> oh. 
Any other questions? Do you give thought to staging as you wrote this? or? Um, no, that's actually one of the things that's actually confounding me a little bit is recovering from a fever and thinking you might be dreaming, it would actually be great to have Orlando reclined. However, there was, um, the Elizabethan Theater favored a bare stage. They would bring out chairs and props and stools if they needed them. You know, like Macbeth has a banquet seat, for example. But as much as possible, it was bare stage. So it might still have been the two of them standing. Or he might have like a crutch or something, or a cane, just to show he's a little infirm. Um, but having him reclined would be my my choice if I were directing it, if it could be worked. Yeah. Yeah. Just a warning: we're down to like three minutes. Okay. Okay. So. So I'll get in. So <laughs> this was this is a dance. beautiful piece of documentation. It really was. Yeah. Really awesome. I tried to explain that I had a good camera, etc., and uh, <laughs> gave that close. <laughs> that <laughs> close. I was using this and using your examples, and it was it was great. This was actually of the three pieces of documentation that I wrote today. This was the one I was happiest with, and the reason is this was the most process oriented. I mean, it's, it's one, because most of my documentation, I have to prove what I'm doing is from this point in the period, and it's, you know, yes, the way I read Arthur Fox stories, I didn't make that up. But this time around, I actually was able to say, okay, this is what I'm doing. Oh, look, this is how Shakespeare did it. Let me break that down for you a little further. Okay, then this is what I'm doing next. And I'm actually much more comfortable when I can take the excellent work and say, this is what's in it, this is what I'm doing instead, you know, in comparison. So this is my, this documentation was a joy to write, compared to especially some of the others I did today. So. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.